Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. This video is a response of a sort to uh, those recent videos by Alakov, Boltorange and Philippe One Gojira. And do excuse me if I've uh, got your name wrong, Phil. As you're relatively new to this community, it doesn't really matter, I suppose. But welcome to the RPG community. I like what I've seen. Sorry I've not commented more, but I have been watching videos, I just haven't really had capacity to write any comments lately. Anyway, anyway, I am responding to the videos on the nature of good in a world of darkness, or preferences as to play good and evil, uh, as well as moral ambiguity in role-playing games, specifically the world of darkness, Gnosticism in a world of darkness. Basically there's been a few back and forth videos between these three, and possibly more that I'm unaware of, in which they have been debating the nature of good in a world of darkness and in other role-playing games. And I struggle for a while to think, where am I going to fit my video? in on this because I've participated in the commenting and I covered a lot of what I wanted to say in that but primarily I want to focus on why good is good in a world of darkness, why good should exist in a world of darkness and I don't mean good should exist in the way of deities or powers or supernatural entities that are completely good, whiter than white, purer than pure because even in a world of darkness Good and evil are abstract concepts. There is no alignment in a world of darkness as there is in Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder. In fact, alignment, if you were to thrust such a thing into a world of darkness, would be completely ridiculous. It is fairly ridiculous in the games that it exists in, and to be honest, the only reason I enjoy it in Planescape is because it's a nice way of dividing up the planes on the Great Wheel between all the different deities and their petitioners, and a way of defining the moods and the way that various petitioners, proxies and so on act. As soon as that alignment gets thrust down to the prime material plane of let's say Faerun and you start saying a paladin has always got to follow the law, has always got to be good and just and holy, otherwise he's not a paladin anymore, I think you're taking alignment too far. It's a good guideline but it shouldn't be a shackle. Uh, that your character has got to constantly adhere to. It may work for some outsiders like demons and devils in uh, the uh, in, in Dungeons and Dragons, but when it comes to a multifaceted mortal, a human for instance, then alignment shouldn't be the be-all and end-all, and therefore in World of Darkness it's impossible to say something is just pure good and something is just pure evil. That doesn't exist. Even if you look back uh, in Old World of Darkness, all the tales of Cain through the Book of Nod and the Erkes fragments, etc. Cain isn't necessarily evil, as such, despite being the first murderer, he is just a very confused individual, he doesn't understand why what he did was wrong when he murdered his brother and when God cursed him, and by the same note you can't say that God, being God, is good. God is likewise a multifaceted, very grey entity that makes some decisions uh, in a very odd way and allows some crimes to be got away with seemingly for no reason within mortal understanding, but then again that's omnipotence and omnipresence, you know, uh, gods can get away with whatever they like. And also, in many ancient religions, you very rarely had gods of good or evil. Gods were of things like harvests, storms, the sun, war, and you would pray to them because you wanted something, because the god personified a particular part of life. You, you wouldn't pray to a god of good or evil, especially a god of evil, because, let's be honest, there'd be no reason for it. Fair enough, pray to a god of thievery. Pray to a god of death, because either you wish death on someone or you wish to save someone's life from death. But you wouldn't pray to a god of evil because that kind of idea, that kind of concept, even when you think of a god like Shiva, goddess of destruction, isn't just all that defines the deity, because along with the destruction comes rebirth, comes the spread of the new, out with the old, in with the new, the maggots that devour the rotten flesh of decaying life. They may be horrific, they may not be pleasant, but they are necessary, as is destruction. And while I'm wavering off the point, 
what I'm trying to get to is the fact that you can never just have a being that is good. At the same time, in a world of darkness, whether it's old world of darkness or new world of darkness, I feel that good is a good thing to attain or aspire to. Alakov mentioned that he thinks that humanity, the path of humanity in Old World of Darkness, or just a vampire's humanity in New World of Darkness, sucks. That it's a ridiculous concept, that it's a vanity, and Voltorange agreed, that it, the Camarilla, or Invictus, is a faction, or covenant, or sect, whatever, set up to bolster the vanity of a vampire, and I do apologise if I've misconstrued what you've said, but I will agree, in some respects it is. Humanity is, to some vampires, an act that the kindred puts upon itself to try and maintain this, well, this illusion of being human, so that it can stand in front of the mirror with the other vampires in Elysium, presumably no La Sombra, and say to their colleagues, doesn't my mask look good? Doesn't my humanity look good? I am acting so human tonight. I don't know why all these vampires speak like that, but bear with me. They're all Toreador. But at the same time, there are other vampires that would cling to humanity because it's the right thing to do. I don't think humanity sucks as much as it is the most difficult path to keep up and believe in. Alakov proposes that the paths of enlightenment pursued by the Sabbat and some of the independent clans are better paths for a vampire to follow, and I apologise if I'm focusing overly on vampire, but I feel this is a good example of how good can exist, even in a game of horror such as the World of Darkness. And it is a world of darkness, it's supposed to be bleak and gloomy and depressing to some extent. Your characters that are cursed, but that doesn't mean they can't rail against their curse. A path of enlightenment is a way of getting around the curse, in a way. It's a way for a sociopath to justify in his mind what he's been doing as right. So whether it's the path of power and the inner voice or the path of honourable accord, those aren't philosophies by which you can really live your life. They are philosophies that you structure around yourself with varying degrees of targets you've got to hit in order to justify in your mind that what you're doing is okay. So. Alright, you're a tyrant in a tower overlooking a bunch of other vampires and mortals alike and providing people pay fealty to you, you'll let them do whatever the hell they like on your land as long as they never disrespect you, that kind of thing. So you'll let murderers get away with murder, you'll let rapists get away with rape because you're following the, the path of the tyrant within the road of kings and as long as they're all passing the coin up to you, the lord of the manor, then you're okay. Well, that's not okay. Well, that's not okay from my perspective, because I'm a human, and being a human, I do believe in the inherent goodness of humanity. I'm not religious in the slightest. I'm hardly f philosophical. But I do believe that humans, generally, are good to each other and are kind to each other, just because it's the only way the human race is able to survive. You know, it's an inbuilt instinct that humans are like that. Uh, and it's trained as well, let's be honest. But to throw that off and start treating your peers and your lessers as, well, chattels, as vermin, means you're no longer being human. And okay, again, I'm drifting off the point. Let's, let's just stick with the fact that to follow a path of enlightenment is to provide some mental justification for the crimes you're committing so that you don't have to succumb to the beast within you simply because you've convinced yourself that what you're doing is okay, despite the fact it clearly isn't to anyone of sound mind, any human. A vampire that clings to the road of humanity could be wearing that mask of humanity, could be pretending, but despite the fact it says in the rule book that when a vampire, when a human is embraced and turned into a vampire, their primary drive becomes blood. They no longer care for food, drink, love, sex, etc. It doesn't mean those things just disappear. Uh, a switch does not flick in your head as soon as you become a vampire and you become a blood-crazed predator, because if it did, you would have succumbed to the beast automatically and forevermore. Rather, you are a human with a curse, and it is up to you, depending on the character, of course, 
to rally against that curse. This is the entire point of Vampire the Masquerade, after all. It is to try and retain your humanity, try to do the decent thing, because you want to do it. If a vampire sees someone who has been hit by a car in the street, no one is going to aid them, the vampire, in my mind, would still feel the urge to try and help that person, not to see how many blood points that person has got left in them. Because at one point that vampire was a human, and they've still got the same human mind, same human memories, they've got an addiction, they are junkies, they need Vitae to survive, but at the same time, that doesn't make them evil, and it doesn't make them one-dimensional. If it did, Vampire would be an incredibly boring game. The struggle to retain humanity, increase humanity, all goes towards the path of Golconda, getting to that pinnacle, that fabled, mythical path that supposedly Sorlot and very few other vampires have reached. Golconda, that but where you have ascended above your curse, where you are still a powerful being, but you are more human than human. Certainly Golconda is, is similarly a scary concept, because you no longer have a beast, you no longer have to wrestle with the monster inside you. That means you could potentially be as cold and cunning as a shark at feed. You aren't ferocious, you aren't uncontrolled, rather you are the perfect, you are the apex predator. But that's one way of looking at it. The other way is looking like you are the pinnacle of humanity in immortal flesh. And so the children of Osiris have a similar kind of thing going on. There's a bloodline of vampire that are probably not worth considering. The Salubri, of course. And let's not forget the Salubri only feed off willing mortals. But then again, so do the Setites quite often. The Setites often surround themselves with herds of mortals, willing followers of Set, that will quite happily give up their blood to their master, your character. Again, does that make them evil? Does that make them good? There is moral ambiguity there, because a vampire is a parasite, but then again, a tapeworm or a tick is a parasite, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're evil. The only difference is that a vampire has choice as do Prometheans, as do werewolves, mages, wraiths, and every other race in the World of Darkness settings. They all have choice. They're not so far gone until they succumb to their beast that they don't know the difference between right and wrong as they learned it as a human. Even if you were embraced into the Sabbat, or let's say Clan Giovanni, you're still going to have a general idea of how you've been raised, and you'll know what the difference is between human rights and human wrongs, and it's going to be very difficult to throw off those preconceptions you have. And fair enough, if you throw them off and you find that clinging to a path of enlightenment is the right way to go for you, then excellent. But that doesn't necessarily mean you are following the best path, because let's be honest, there is no best path. But if a vampire was to be a human that was turned into a vampire, the first thing they would cling to, and the predominant thing they would cling to, in my mind, is their humanity. And humanity, in my mind, is good. And so, good does exist in the world of darkness, but it's not all around you. Everyone else is falling off the path. Everyone else is stra straying away from humanity. Everyone else is succumbing to their beasts. Every other monster around is more monstrous than you. The world of darkness is dark. It is evil. It pervades. Corruption pervades the entire setting. But that doesn't mean you can't try and aspire to reach those tiny pinpricks of light, those tiny nuggets of goodness that are laying in wait, that are, of course, the seeds that adventures are made out of. So yes, in my mind, good should exist in the world of darkness, but not as something that's ever present, not as something that's ever clear, but something that should be aspired to, because if you do not aspire towards good deeds, good actions, and a character is made up of his actions and his deeds, his goals, his motivations. That's the same throughout any World of Darkness game. And while you can have any overall motivation that may well be, I will become the prince of this city, there's still the steps you've got to take towards getting there. And whether you kill that person you're feeding from, or just let them live, or whether you kill your opponents, or exile them to another city, all these sorts of things are what makes a character good, decent, honourable, call it what you will. Good exists, but it can only exist through the actions of your characters. Thank you very much for watching.